Good morning, Blue Ridge family. Good to see you today. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Carney, pastor at Blue Ridge Baptist Church in Wetumpka, Alabama. Uh, what we're going to look at today is prayer. The title of this morning's message is, Does God Really Care? What we're going to look at is uh, three aspects of prayer. One, the attitude of prayer. And that is an understanding that God really wants to bless us. And secondly, the uh, substance of prayer, and that's simply our call to God to be blessed and to receive His blessings. And finally, the response to prayer, which is that we seek to be a blessing for God and the people in our lives. Now, uh, our passage, focal passage this morning is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, if you want to dig in and take a look there. And if this is a normal Sunday... Then before my message, I would have gathered up the kids right over here and uh, had a little uh, sermon with them. And of course, we would have shared our very bad riddles. And so I'm going to share two riddles with you this morning as we begin. And these are in honor of uh, Miss Avery, who lost a couple teeth this week. Uh, When is the best time to go to see a dentist? What time? And of course, that is at uh, tooth hurting. And if you think that's bad, uh, the last one is... Uh, why did the king go to see the dentist? And you already know that because he wanted a crown. Anyway, moving forward, have you ever wondered, does God really care? And our nation is going through a tough time. People are sick. uh, Healthcare workers are stressed out. Businesses are stressed. Some businesses are closed and some folks are unemployed right now. And they're wondering uh, if God really cares. They're wondering If their prayers really matter, they're wondering what is going to happen next. The people of Israel felt that way on many occasions. And the passage we're going to look at today uh, is is about one of those times when they felt and wondered if God was really caring for them. In the book of Chronicles, it was written by a fellow by the name of Ezra. And it was written for the exiles, those who were returning from Babylon finally back to Israel. And they began to wonder in their heart uh, whether uh, uh, God had uh, still called them to be the chosen people. Uh, That was on their heart. The burning question in their heart was, is God still interested in us? Are the covenants still in force? We know that we don't have King David or King Solomon anymore, but are your promises to them still valid for us today? And, uh, and maybe you're wondering the same thing too. Does God really care for you? Are His promises still true today? Ezra answers these questions uh, by reminding the people. He reminds the people of all the things that God has done for them in the past. In the first nine verses, he goes on a genealogy tour of all the famous folks of Israel. From uh, creation uh, to the time they have, were coming back from exile. And he mentions some 500 names of folks he wants to include. And then from chapter 10 to 29, he talks about David and about how God worked in mighty ways through the life of David. Now, today's passage is found in that boring section where all those 500 names are found. And we're going to meet a fellow by the name of Jabez. So if you look with me in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, two little verses, verses 9 and 10. It says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. Now, first of all, we look at the proper attitude to prayer. And that is that God wants to bless us. He wants to bless you. In verse 10, we find that God granted his requests. Everybody has a name. A lot of folks have a name that has meaning. Sometimes today, folks just give folks a name just because it sounds nice. But especially in uh, Jabez's time, uh, when you had a name, it had significance. What people thought of you, what people thought about your future would be. King Solomon's name means peace. And certainly in his time, the nation of Israel, while he ruled, had peace as never as they had before. Now, Jabez's name, on the other hand, means what? It means pain. And now why? 
verse 9 says that she gave birth to him in pain. Now, whether it was just a traumatic childbirth or there are other things going on, his mother's life that were traumatic or painful, whatever we know, it was a big deal to her. It was a traumatic event. And so she named her son Pain. Now, when people saw Jabez coming, what they thought in their mind was, here is pain. Here is someone who is going to be pain, and here is someone who's going to be painful if you get to know him. And no child likes a name like that. As I thought about it this week, I was reminded of that old Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue. There's some names you just don't want. And I'm sure Jabez Jabez wondered, does God really care about me? And he found out in verse 10 that he did. He made several simple requests to God. He said, God, bless me. God, enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And the Bible says what? The Bible says that God granted his requests. Now, when we think about prayer, what is it? Prayer is our communication with God. It's our opportunity to to, uh, praise Him for all that He is. It's our opportunity to thank Him for the many blessings He's given to us. And it's an opportunity for us to communicate with Him, for us to share our burdens with Him, and for us to ask for help. Now, when we come to Him, as we talk to God, what attitude do we have? Many folks think God is distant. He's just so far away from them. Others just believe that God really doesn't care. We're just kind of left here all on our own. But what did Jabez discover? Jabez discovered that God wants to bless us. God wanted to bless him. And if you'll read God's Word, you will find at every turn, wherever you go in God's Word, you will find that God wants to bless you and that God loves you. Some of the verses I truly love in Scripture are a few of these. Hebrews 11.6 And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and what? And that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. You ought to believe that He's going to bless you, that He wants to do something good in your life. And 1 John 3, verse 16 This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His love for us. And 1 John 4, 19, we love, why? Because He first loved us. And then in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 16, listen to this very closely. Let us then approach the throne of grace with what? With confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Why do we approach God with confidence? Because God desires to bless us. I remember reading a story about a man many years ago. Uh, Actually, he was at the early days of our country. And he was on a trip. And he'd come to a river and he was at a tough spot. Because just earlier, a storm had washed the ferry away. And so he had no way to cross the river. Well, out of nowhere, strangers rode up on horseback. And he looked at them, sized them up for a minute and looked at the tallest one in the saddle and simply said to him, will you allow me to ride with you as you cross the river? Well, the man reached down his hand and pulled him up, and they went across the river, and his need was taken care of. When he got off the horse, one of the fellows that had ridden up pulled him aside and says, do you realize that you have just asked the President of the United States if you could ride on horseback with him? And he said, why did you ask him, of all people? And the man said, well, when you all rode up, I looked at all your faces, and every one of your faces said no, and his said yes. So I asked him, when you come and you pray before God and you look at his face, you will see a face that says yes, a face that says yes to you. Most people don't understand God or how he feels about you. When I was in seminary, I spent two summers at a church called First Baptist Church Thomasville. It's in Georgia, just north of Tallahassee. And I had great two summers there. Wonderful congregation, a great group of teenagers. I got to disciple and and a lot of great memories. And I remember the first time that I got to meet them, they flew me out there so that I could meet everybody and they could also find me a place to live for the summer. And it was about Easter. And I remember going around with a guy named Dave Berryhill. And he was going around trying to find me a place to live. 
Now, at this point in my life, I was not married, and, and I'd been living in dorm rooms and all the way in college and in seminary. And if I had a bed and a bathroom, then I was happy. That's all I was looking for. But as I went around with Dave, we went and looked at apartments in all kinds of places, garage apartments and rooms to rent and stuff. And as we came out of each one of them, they said the same thing over and over again. That is not good enough for you. Finally, they took me to a new apartment complex that had just been opened. And I ended up with a room that no one had lived in except me. It had a big living room, a beautiful bedroom, a big kitchen. And not only on the property, there was a pool and there was even a lake to swim on. And, I mean, to, to fish in, not to swim in. For two summers, that's where I lived. That's how God feels about you. Many times I think God looks at our lives and He looks over what we're doing and where our life is and He looks down and He simply says to Himself, that is not good enough for you. Why? Because God wants to bless you. He wants the very best for you. And how does He say it? For God so loved the world that He gave. God gave for us. He wants to bless us. And we can approach God in prayer believing that He wants to bless us because it's true. Well, that's the attitude of prayer. But what is the substance of prayer? In verse 10, it says, Jabez cried out before the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me. We need to call out to Him. That's how our relationship with God begins. In Romans 10, 13, it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, God is not limited by His power uh, or his desire to bless. What is he limited by? He's limited by you and me. When we will not call out to him and receive his blessing. What does James say in James 4.2? You do not have. Why? Because you do not ask God. Every hear of an unclaimed blessing. I remember when I came to the South, I first heard that term. I heard it referring to two ways. One, to silverware. If after a meal you hadn't used your knife or your fork or your spoon, they would put it back in the drawer. It was an unclaimed blessing to be used later. And then I heard that of young women. If they were not married, they were considered an unclaimed blessing. I don't know, maybe that sounds sexist now. Also notice they never said young men that weren't married were unclaimed blessings. But I know in our relationship with God, there are many unclaimed blessings. There are blessings that God wants to give us that we have simply not claimed, we've not asked God for, we've not been willing to receive. That was not true of Jabez. Jabez called out to God. In one translation it says, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Which means it's almost like Jabez was giving an exclamation point to all his requests to God. He said, Enlarge my territory! Exclamation mark. Let your hand be with me! Exclamation mark. Keep me from harm so that I can be free from pain, exclamation mark. Jabez laid it all out before God. Bless me. He said, I don't want to be in pain. I don't want to be what my mother predicted me to be. And he said, please me, allow me to feel your presence and to be protected. Please allow me to have more in my life so I can bless my family and so I can honor you with it. He opens up his heart to God. And what does God do? God answers. What does it mean to bless something? Oftentimes we use that word just flippantly. We ask God to bless the missionaries. We ask God to bless us, to bless our food. What does that mean? We are simply asking God to, to, uh, to import a divine movement, a divine power, something that uh, can't be done by anybody else but God. We're calling on God to do what only God can do. I came across a verse of Scripture the other day in Proverbs 10, 22. In the Living Bible, it says it this way. The Lord's blessing is our greatest wealth. We're asking God to do something that no one else can do for us. Wilkins, in his little book about Jabez, says, We're crying out for the wonderful, unlimited goodness that only God has the power to know about or to give us. I heard someone say that when we come to God, the kind of prayers that God answers are twofold. He answers prayers of protection. He answers prayers of provision. To protect us from the countless things that uh, can harm us. And sometimes that's to protect us even from ourselves. And to provide for us so that we can meet our needs and so that we can bring Him glory. 
While Jabez had a list of things he prays for, he begins with a simple prayer for God's blessing. Putting the blessing where? In God's hands. That reminds me of passage of Scripture in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, the Apostle John writes this. He says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that He hears us whatever we ask. And we know that we have what we ask of Him. And I remember the first time I read that passage, I thought I got all excited. That means whatever I ask God, He will give to me. And then all of a sudden I caught on to the catch. As long as it is according to His will. And when I thought about that, I was reminded of that's something that a parent would say. You know, I'm going to give you whatever you want as long as it's what I really desire and long for you. And in in a way, as a kid, I would have thought that's a bad trick. But as you think about it, it's not. Why? Because who wants the best for you? Who knows what's best for you? It is Him. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to Him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to His power that is at work within us, We can't even imagine all the good things God wants to do for us. Jabez said, God, it's in your hands. Bless me. He trusted in God to know what is best for him and to have the power to deliver it. Louis Perlau, a great evangelist from uh, South America, shared how he's seen God answer his prayers in five different ways. One, he says, sometimes God says no. He is the God of creation. He doesn't have to say yes. But often when he says no, he says no because I love you too much to give you what you want. Secondly, he said yes, but you'll have to wait. And I remember him telling the story of a guy by the name of Phil Calloway and his wife Ramona. In 1996, they were in their 20s, had a couple of young children and life was good, but suddenly Ramona started getting seizures. She got them every day and then soon every hour. And one day Phil had all he could take and he went in the backyard and fell on his knees and said, God, I can't take it anymore. You've got to do something. As soon as he got off his knees, God reminded him of the name of a doctor someone had shared with him months earlier. In the morning, he got on the phone. They visited that doctor. He examined her. And within a week, he discovered that she had some kind of chemical deficiency in her system. Medicine went in. And within a few weeks, he said, my wife was back. God asked us in Matthew 7, 7 to ask, to seek, and knock. And sometimes we have to keep on doing it, but the door will be answered. Sometimes, thirdly, Lewis says, God says yes, but it's not what you expected. NFL running back Sherman Smith was a Christian with a strong faith. He was also very strong on the field. He was called the Sherman Tank. He was a local legend in in, uh, Seattle with the Seahawks. He began to pray, God, use me in a different and a mighty way. And suddenly he got traded to the sea, to San Diego. And uh, he was there not just two weeks, but he got injured. And he began to spend a whole lot of time in the, in the training room trying to recover. And he began to th- ask God, God, why did you send me here? Until he met someone in the training room, a fellow teammate named Miles McPherson, who was pretty much of a party animal. As they spent all that time in the training room, he led him to Christ. In short order, Miles began to become an evangelist for Christ. And every year, he reaches 10,000 students for Christ and touches their lives. It was not how he expected, but God worked in his life in a mighty way. Fourth, Lewis says, God sometimes says yes, and here's more. There was a guy in Australia named David Smallbone. And uh, he had a dream in his heart to have Christian concerts in his own country and to get people inspired by them. And so he organized one. By the end of the concert series, uh, he was $250,000 in debt. There are not many Christians in Australia. Uh, He was in bad shape. They repossessed his house. He got on a phone call with a fellow in Nashville and says, I have a job for you if you can come. So they sold everything they had remaining got tickets, and he and his six children flew to Nashville. But when they got there, suddenly the job was gone. And they gathered the children around around and said, we have to pray. We don't know what's happening. As they began to pray, God began to let people help them in small ways. Bags of groceries showed up. Someone gave them an old minivan. Odd jobs began to appear. And then out of the blue, his 15-year-old daughter 
got a contract, a singing contract. She took on her uh, family's old name, and her name is Rebecca St. James. And from that moment on, he didn't manage other groups. He managed his daughter that he travels around the world with. And finally, God sometimes says, yes, and uh, I thought you would never ask. And I remember he tells the story of a guy named Luke Ludler, and a senior adult. And one day he was at his house and he fell. He severely hurt himself and ended up in the hospital. But while he was in the hospital, someone shared the gospel message, and he prayed and asked Jesus to be his Lord and Savior. Almost his very next prayer was this, God, please save my wife. Save my wife. She does not know you. His wife had already gone on a trip to California to see her sister. And on that very day, someone approached her, shared the gospel, and she too prayed to receive Christ. And you know, God answers our prayers in big and small ways. I remember years ago, we had accepted a call to go to a church, and we had not transplanted to there yet, but we wanted our kids to start in the school system there on the first day. And so I remember we were riding down the road, wanting to give them a good first day. And as we rode down the road, suddenly we had a flat tire. And as we were pulling off the side of the road, we simply prayed, God, help us to get this fixed quickly because uh, we want to get the kids there on time. About that time, we heard a voice from the back seat saying, there's an angel behind us. When I got out of the car, there was an angel. It was a road angel. That's what it said on the side of the truck. One of the local car dealerships had a truck driving back and forth. And within a couple of minutes, he had the tire off and on, and we were down the road. God answers prayers in big and small ways. Finally, our response to prayer. Our response to prayer is once God blesses us and answers our prayer, it's a seek to be a blessing. In verse 9, it says, Jabed was more honorable than his brothers. One commentator said, we don't know why his brothers were so unhonorable. And I don't think that's the point at all. I remember reading Galatians 6, 3, and 4. It tells us we're not to compare ourselves with other people to see if we're better. You can always find someone who's worse than you. If you're a bank robber, you can find a murderer. If you're a murderer, you can find a child abuser. You can find someone. The point is, Jabez, out of gratefulness to God, wanted to be a blessing to God and to others. He wanted to honor God with his life. Uh, Bruce Wilkinson, in his little book about Jabez, said that he was a gimper. Not the, not the gipper from that Ronald Reg movie, but a gipper. And a gip, gimper is, uh, is, comes from a furniture term. What it means is to do those extra little details that make a furniture valuable and, 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 and wanted. It means not just to go through the motion, but to do something extra. And he says that's what Jabez was. And if you love God, that's what you do. Over in 1 John 5, 3, it says, This is love for God. How do we love God? To obey His commands. And what does it say about them? And His commands are not burdensome. The proper response to answered prayer is obedience. Uh, now, whatever God has done for us is grace. We're not doing it to pay Him back. We're doing it because we love God. Because we have been blessed. And we want to be a blessing to God, and we want to be a blessing to others in our life. We obey Him, and we seek to do more for Him. I had a pastor growing, uh, growing up named Dr. Bryant, and he used to sing this song, and I love this little chorus. It's entitled, I Could Never Outlove the Lord. And the chorus of the song is this, I'm going to live the way He wants me to live. I'm going to give until there's just no more to give. I'm going to love, love, till there's just no more love. I could never, never outlove the Lord. And once you know the love of God, uh, you can never outlove the Lord. But you sure can die trying. Now, does God care about you? Yes. He wants to bless you. He wants, to, uh, you, want, he wants you to call out to Him to be blessed. And He wants you to be a blessing to Him and to bring honor to His name. Now today, for some folks, life may be tough for you. I remember reading about Charles Spurgeon. He was a someone who went through depressions and hard times, and he said this. He said, a Christian is one who trusts God uh, when he cannot trace God. He says, when the dark night of the soul comes, when the tears flow over like a river from a rainstorm, and when our prayers seem to bounce off the ceiling, we can rest assured that our prayers are heard and answered 
not just by the God who reigns, but by the God who provides, nourishes, promises, and promises to make all things new. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you that you care about us so much you sent your Son. And if there's anyone today who's not received your gift of salvation, let them receive that today. And for all of us who claim you as Savior and Lord, let us never forget that you want to work in our life now and you want to bless us so that we can be a blessing to others and so we can bring honor to the others' names. Let us lift up our fears and our burdens to you and lean upon you and know that you will answer us. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Blue Ridge family, just know that Jackie and I love you very much. Call on us anytime. Good days are ahead, and we'll be through this all together. As you've heard, our church got hit by a tree, but good things are happening. The tree's already up today. It happened, and uh, we're working on getting everything taken care of. So be in prayer. God loves you. God loves us and got plans for us, and we long to be together. And you can call on me anytime. We love you. And I want to say one other word today, uh, and this is a shout-out to the governor of New York, uh, Andrew Cuomo. He declared that the, 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 the virus is trending down in New York, and for that we praise God for that. But he went on to say these words, God has nothing to do with it, prayers had nothing to do with it, and faith had nothing to do with it. I grew up uh, with a home with a Ph.D. My dad was a college professor. I grew up around scientists. One of our family friends had a Ph.D. in microbiology and worked in a huge government lab where I grew up. I asked him one day, does your faith ever conflict with your science? And he said, no. He said, the more I know about how things come together and work, the more I know it is all about God. I believe in science. I believe in doctors. I also believe in a God who created us with bodies that almost heal themselves all the time. And with a God who gave us a brain to figure out how to tackle just about anything, including this virus. Without God, we have no hope. But the good news is, even if you don't believe in God, God believes in you and he wants to bless you and receive you. God bless you and you have a great week. Thank you so much.